Hello and welcome to my video on your CPU and of course your memory. Let's get right to it. Now we'll be starting with your CPU. The CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. Now the Central Processing Unit is made up of the Control Unit, the Arithmetic and Logic Unit, and finally your Registers, which are a temporary storage. Let's take a closer look at the Control Unit. The control unit's job is to grab instructions and data from the memory, then decode the instructions and move them over to the arithmetic and logic unit. The arithmetic logic unit's job is basically very much implied. It does arithmetic and then it also does some logic. And finally once it's done, it moves the data over to the register or the memory. Now let's take a closer look at the registers. The registers are basically super fast temporary storage. They collect results of operations, addresses of data, data received from the RAM, and also general purpose storage. Now let's talk about some measures of power. But before that, let's talk about some conversion factors, starting with the kilo. A kilobyte is equal to 1024 bytes. Then we have the megabyte. A megabyte contains 1024 squared. After that, we have a gigabyte, which is 1024 cubed. And then finally, you have a terabyte, and you guessed it, it's 1024 to the fourth power. Okay, so once that we have that out of the way, let's move on to measures of power, starting with number one. Number one is the number of machine cycles per second. One hertz is exactly one cycle per second. Then we have number two. Number two is the number of instructions per second. Then we have number three. Number three is the number of floating point operations per second. Now floating point is something that looks like this. Notice the exponent there. And after this one, we finally get to number four. Number four is benchmark tests, which is actual data instead of these numerical factors that we got before. Now let's talk about some different types of processing, starting with serial processing. Now, in whatever type of processing, there are a couple steps the processor takes, starting with the fetch, then the decode, then execute, and finally it stores the results. Now on the side, I'm going to put on the machine cycle, so cycle 1 through cycle 6. And then I'm going to put a green dot to represent one instruction. So if we put this instruction into the CPU, first it's going to fetch, then in the second cycle it's going to decode, then execute, and then finally it's going to store the results. Now if we take a look at this, you'll notice that you can only do one, one instruction requires four cycles, so this is kind of bad. So this brings us to pipeline processing. In pipeline processing you can have multiple instructions so in six cycles you can complete three instructions which is a lot better than before now let's discuss multi-processing in multi-processing you have multiple cpus or cores and let's say we have four instructions represented by those blocks in multi-processing you can process each of them at the same time because you have multiple cpus however what if you only had one cpu in that case, if you have four instructions to be completed, you need to use multi-programming. In multi-programming, you split up the task by going one by one. So you do the first one, then the second one. And if one of them still requires more time, it would go back to it after the cycle is completed. So now let's talk about your memory. There are certain types of memory that you have on your computer. And let's talk starting with the secondary storage. Your secondary storage contains your hard drive. Now the hard drive requires 10 million cycles in order to send data from the hard drive to your registers. Now it costs about 10 cents per gigabyte, so it's pretty cheap. Now after that, you have your primary memory, which is faster. This has your dynamic RAM. A picture of it is up there in the top. And it requires only 1,000 cycles, but it costs $5 per gigabyte. Notice the big price difference already. Now after the primary memory, you move on to the L2 cache. Now the L2 cache is super fast storage, it only requires 10 cycles. 
and the cost is huge, it's $40,000 per gigabyte. Then you have the L1 cache with even faster 2-4 to four cycles and I don't even want to know how much it costs. And finally you have the registers which is even even faster, it's the fastest. Now notice the price going up and also the secondary storage is non-volatile so it stays. However your primary L1, L2, whatever all get deleted after your computer is shut down. Okay, so now let's talk about your ROM. A ROM is a read-only memory, so you can only read from it, not write. Now here is an example of one bit, so you can either store a zero or a one. The triangle is called a diode in electricity. Now this right now is a one since the circuit is complete. However, if you were to disturb the circuit, like let's say you just deleted the diode, then you have a broken circuit and electricity can't flow, so that would be counted as a zero. After that we have the dynamic RAM, I'm not going to go too far into it, but maybe just a little. So the yellow part of this diagram is a transistor, and the red is a capacitor. Now capacitor stores charge, so it can store or not store anything. If it doesn't store anything, it's a zero. If it stores something, it's a one. Now this is one bit. So unfortunately though, this charge kind of seeps out, so you need to continuously refresh the memory which actually happens more often than you think. Alright, so that's it for this video and you know the drill. Make sure to smash that like button and subscribe for more. See you next time!